the audio is on. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time and we've got a bunch of new groups joining us today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. So thank you all for spending some of your time with us today. I do want to note before we get underway with today's topic that we have so much on the go in the next few weeks. Starting literally tomorrow is our Global Biodiversity Festival, uh, 60 plus programs, three incredible days, all to raise money for incredible conservation groups around the world. So check out globalbiofest.com to learn more about that. In just a few weeks, we'll be doing our Epic Oceans Week as well. We just put out the newsletter for this. So if you want to hang out with some of the world's top ocean explorers, that is your one-stop way to do that and register for those programs. And of course, this is May, which means this is our Backyard Bio Global Nature Campaign all month long, encouraging kids like you to get outdoors, exploring their local wildlife, discovering all these amazing things that live near you, and sharing that passion with the world. So check out backyardbio.net. Head to a social media with hashtag Backyard Bio to get excited about all the incredible local nature around the globe. Now today we are honoring Backyard Bio by bringing in a new speaker on a very exciting topic. Dr. Corey Lawson is joining us from the Royal BC Museum in lovely Victoria, British Columbia, Canada to tell us today a little bit about a really misunderstood and much maligned group of creatures in bats. Now I grew up absolutely loving bats. I think they're one of the most amazing groups of animals on the planet and I'm sure Dr. Lawson will echo that sentiment. But if you're on the fence about them. I hope today's program changes your mind and introduces this amazing world of how they navigate through the world through echolocation and so, so much more. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lawson to blow our mind over the next 20 minutes and take it away. Corey, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thank you, Jesse. And thanks, everybody, for your interest in bats. So we are going to dive in today to learn what it is that bats sound like, why we don't hear them, and how that explains so much about what we know about bats. No, that did not work for me to advance. Okay, there we go, excellent. Here we are in beautiful British Columbia walking along through the forest and all of a sudden it goes dark. Now, as a human, we're kind of in trouble if we don't have a flashlight, right? We could maybe get down on our hands and knees, feel around, try not to run into a tree, it's going to be pretty tricky though, for us to continue walking through this forest. Bats, on the other hand, have no problem at all. They fly around our forest at night all the time and they see where they're going. They've got eyes, they can use their eyes, it's great. And if there's moon, they probably will use their eyes. But if it's completely dark, they're going to depend on something else. And that something else is the production of sound. Now we can make sounds if we yell out of our mouth, or we clap our hands, we can generate sound. What we have a really hard time as humans doing is making anything um, come out of those echoes. We can sometimes hear some echoes, but we don't really have the brains to figure out what that echo means. If there was a tree in front of us and the sound were bouncing off the tree, we likely wouldn't be able to use that information at all. But bats on the other, other hand, do an extremely good job of this. So bats, as they fly around at night, they're using sound and their ears to navigate and figure out where it is they're flying, make sure they don't run into anything, and to look for food. So they're sending out sounds. Those sounds bounce off. Whatever's in front of them comes back, and their little brains interpret those sounds and be able to piece together an image, much like how we do with our eyes. They see their world through their ears. So they can tell how far away an object is and what does it look like. Now, we're going to um, dive into just a tiny bit of physics because this is the bat's world. Sound is everything to a bat. And there's some unfortunate parts about the way sound works that actually makes it really tricky for bats. So sound is a wave, and I'm sure some of you are studying this right now. Sound actually doesn't quite look like the wave I've drawn here. And so just to be technically correct, I want to just give you a little quick caveat, a little demo of what sound uh, looks like. Sound is what's actually on the right for you. It's the pink one. You can see it, it's kind of, it's very hard to see maybe, look closely and you can see that there's movement as the wave moves from left to right. In air, it would be moving with the air molecules. On the left, if you look really closely, it looks like the ripple of a pond. Now, 
The one on the left isn't actually the type of wave that sound is. It's a, it's a transverse wave, whereas uh, sound is actually a longitudinal wave. But it's really tricky to teach <laughs> on a slide properties of sound using um, a longitudinal wave. So we're going to jump back and let's just pretend now that we're going to use the transverse wave. It's what we're going to call sound. And we're going to learn a little bit about how sound uh, works from a bat's perspective. So let's have an object. Now we've got a wave that approaches the object and goes right around it. Well, that means that this particular object wasn't very big in relation to the wave. So the wave went right on by it. So long wavelengths or short wavelengths make a big difference as to whether it goes around an object or if it hits the object and bounce back as a reflection or an echo. So again, just a tiny bit of physics here, but a short wavelength versus a long wavelength, it's kind of obvious. You can see that if you measure from one point to, an, to um, another point in the wave, we use them, um, sometimes we call these things crests or troughs, where the wave goes up or down. If we just measure that and say one is long as one is short, then what we can start to talk about is how short or how long does a wavelength need to be for a bat to use it. So let's now go back to an object and let's have that sound wave approach it. It hit and it bounced back. That's a reflection or an echo that a bat could then hear. So this is a nice match. That object is about the right size for that wavelength. The wavelength is just short enough that it hits it and doesn't go around it. Now that's a really important point because what a bat is looking for is not a little round ball like I've drawn. It is actually looking for an insect like this moth that I've just um, shown you here. If the sound bounces off the moth, the bat will find it. So a wavelength must be short enough for small reflective objects and it turns out bats eat insects. And so that's the small object that they're really looking for. So their wavelengths have to be short or small in order to find those insects. Now, how do we measure that? Well, just to give you a sense, I'm going to talk about human hearing. So humans can hear certain wavelengths, but our, the wavelengths we hear are usually pretty long. Now that means they've got a small number like five kilohertz. That's probably the frequency at which I'm talking. That's a pretty long wavelength. Bats typically produce sound above what our ears can hear. Very, very tiny, small wavelengths. A given a number there of 20 kilohertz, that's the magic number we typically refer to as ultrasound. Human hearing doesn't hear over 20, and so we call anything above that ultrasound, and that's what bats produce. Most bats. Now, bats can go really high frequency, extremely small wavelengths then. Um, I've given you a number here of 120 kilohertz, but they can go higher than that, and especially um, in different species around the world. So, if we are looking at a very long wavelength, we are going to be able to hear that with our ears. But if it's a very small wavelength, we won't. Now, there is another unfortunate part about the length of waves. So the high frequency ones, these ones that we call ultrasound, they're really good because they can detect tiny little objects like insects. But the problem with them, they don't go very far. So a big, long wavelength, like ones we can um, easily hear, and like what I'm, I'm producing right now as I talk to you, those go long ways. But that um, echolocation, which is dependent on ultrasound, it just doesn't go very far. So when a bat is producing ultrasound, it may only go a couple of meters out in front of it, unlike our voices, which we know can travel much further, especially if we yell. So bats producing low frequencies, okay, so out of the all, all the ultrasound frequencies they can be producing, the lower they can go, the better in terms of getting their sound way out in front of them. If they use even higher frequencies, then their sound is just not going to go very far. And again, this is really important for how a bat lives. So what do we know so far? We know that bats typically echolocate at these really high frequencies that we can't hear because they have to find food and that food is insects and insects are small. Now, is there a way we can hear that ultrasound? And if, if so, well, what does it sound like? Yes, we can hear the ultrasound because we have developed 
tools to hear ultrasound. And those we refer to typically as bat detectors. And so there's a lot of different bat detectors. There's some fun ones. I'm just gonna show you in the camera here, a picture of a, a, an iPad with a little tiny bat detector attached to it. And we can record bats um, and hear ultrasound with that. I'm gonna show you now a kind of a really basic type of bat detector. And the fun thing about this is I like to kind of hmm, give you some examples of things that are ultrasonic that make you think, oh, thank gosh, we can't hear ultrasound. So sniffing, for example, just breathing, okay? I'm breathing, you don't really hear much until I turn on the bat detector, which will um, tell me if there's any ultrasound being produced. Now I'm gonna breathe again. We don't hear ultrasound. We drive each other crazy listening to each other breathe. Same thing with this. We can rub our fingers. Okay, doesn't make much of a sound until I turn on the bat detector. And yeah, so bats hear a lot. In fact, you kind of wonder how they don't go crazy hearing all that ultrasound. What running water gives off ultrasound as well. Um, and and some bats actually avoid. Um, um, like rapids on a river and stuff because of that, because it's just so loud. All right, so now let's look at what a bat call when they make their sound. What does it actually look like? I kind of, you might've seen on the iPad already a little bit of this. Um, I'm showing you on the screen now, those purple um, or kind of pinkish purple um, vertical lines there. Okay, those are bat pulses. So that's a burst of sound that they produce. And they're very high frequency. In fact, you can see the line I've drawn across the screen, it says 40 kilohertz. So all of those start well above that. This, these are calls we would never hear with our human ear. And they produce a burst of sound, and then there's a break, and then a burst of sound, and then there's a break. And I don't know if we have time uh, to just kind of ask like, what is it that's going on? while Absolutely. the bat is not making the sound. Yeah, so uh, if any of our groups want to chime in, we've got a bunch of YouTube classes. If you guys want to share in the chat, what do you think is happening when the bats aren't making any sound in those silent bits in the middle? Uh, Avoca West, uh, Glenview, Illinois, what do you guys think are grade four crew? Hmm. What do you guys think? What's going on there? Go ahead. Owen. I think, like, I think the bat is processing what He's to processing what's going on around. Oh, yeah. excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, its little brain is going uh, probably a mile a minute trying to figure out what's going on. And, and what it's doing there is it's listening to the echoes, right? So during that time, it's listening for the echoes. And then its brain is trying to figure out where it's flying and making sure it doesn't bump into anything while it's looking for food. Perfect. Okay, so... We, yes, we know that they are echolocating high frequencies to find food. We also know that bats are using sound bursts and then listening for echoes. And why bats are so darn loud? Oh, wait a minute. I didn't actually tell you that bats were so darn loud, but they are. They're so loud, in fact, it's like taking a smoke detector that's going off and holding it up to your ear. Ah, that would hurt. That's so loud. That's too loud. In fact, bats do echolocate too loud. They are producing ultrasound so loudly that they would damage their ears, just like a smoke detector would damage ours if we held it up to our ears. So what do bats do? Well, they're screaming and they don't have earplugs. So they luckily have evolved to have something very similar to earplugs. In, they have control over the little bones that are in their ear. And those little bones that allow us to hear can be just ever so slightly disconnected so that we don't hear and then put them back together. So then we do hear. That's what's happening with the bats. They can control those little muscles um, inside their ear. So they will make the loud sound while they literally temporarily deafen themselves so that it doesn't hurt their ears. And then they'll put those little bones back together to listen for the echoes. And they do this over and over and over 10 times a second. Pretty amazing. So now we know. Oops, okay, that we are not going to go through. That was supposed to be off. Oh, well, that's okay. These things happen. All right, so why bats are so darn loud? Well, they need to see a long ways out in front, right? 
So we can actually listen to bats. Luckily, it's not going to sound too loud to us because the bat sound is only really, really loud and painful right in front of its nose. So as soon as the sound gets far enough away from its face, it's no longer that loud. Now you might be thinking, uh, what does it sound like? So let's just do a quick um, listen of some bats. I always love these parts. Anyone who's never heard bat calls on a bat detector or device, it's just amazing. Yes, so hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Let's start off. This is um, what we call a, a hoary bat. Perfect. Can you hear that? Yeah, it's a slight little pulses. Okay. So what we're hearing there is in what's called time expansion. It means it's slowed down. The bat is not really echolocating that slowly, but it's nice for us to hear it that way because we get to hear all of the sounds it's producing. But if you want to hear it more in a way that the bat is actually creating the sound, oops, let's go back to here and let's change that setting. Okay, now let's try listening to it again. Can you hear a bunch of pop, 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 pops? Yeah, it sounds like someone running down the street in like floppy slippers or something. <laughs> totally. Okay, great. And now that was a low frequency type of bat. Now I'm going to play a really high frequency type of bat, one that can, um, can detect much smaller objects in front of it because it's using these high frequencies. Oops, I have to change this setting here. There we go. Hey, can you hear that? Cool, yeah. Yeah, sounds very different, doesn't it? So all of those little pulses of sound, they're very quick, 10 times per second. So it's its pretty tricky to hear them. Um, sometimes it sounds a little bit like a buzz. But um, but yeah, if you hear a bunch of little clicking um, in, in your uh, speakers there, that was the bat. So now I'm going to pull that off and we'll go back to the presentation. Okay, so kind of our last big topic is how echolocation fits in with what bats look like and what they eat. So it's all kind of a big puzzle. It all fits together very nicely. How big are the ears? What are the wings like? What is the body shape of the bat? And, and therefore, if we understand how they echolocate based on their, their body shape, then we can actually figure out some of the things that they might eat as well. Those are all tied together. Now, in the book that was mentioned earlier, Bats of British Columbia, that myself and co-authors wrote, um, we go through all of the bats of BC. So I'm just going to quickly introduce you to some of these, just so you've seen some of the, the neat little characters here. This is um, a pallid bat, um, a spotted bat, a Townsend's big-eared bat. And then we got a whole slew of little bats called myotis. So this is a Yuma myotis, a long-legged myotis, it goes on, fringed myotis, little brown myotis, long-eared myotis, northern myotis, California myotis, and dark-nosed, small-footed myotis. Um, we also have a big brown bat, a silver-haired bat, and then these two are really quite special. These ones fly into Canada each summer, and yet they don't live here in the winter. All the other ones that I showed you hibernate um, and stay for our winter. But the two that are at the bottom here, the Eastern Red and the Hoary Bat, they fly long distances to migrate south for the winter. Um, and they just hang out in foliage in trees. So in amongst the leaves. So they're pretty unusual in that way because all other bats like to tuck into cracks and hide. Um, but these guys, this um, red bat and hoary bat, they just hang out in the leaves. Now I'm going to focus on the hoary bat to start with because it's an interesting example um, when we look at its echolocation. One of the recordings that we just heard um, on the other the um, the uh, file that I played for you was a hoary bat. Now hoary bats migrate, and so they have to be very fast. They're fast flyers. They're strong. They're our biggest bat in Canada. They're built for speed, but because of that they need to be able to echolocate appropriately. It's like a car driving in the dark. If your headlights aren't very bright, you can't go very fast. So hoary bats, they need bright headlights if they're gonna go fast. So how, do, how does a bat get bright headlights? Well, it's their sound. And I realize now maybe we, don't, we won't take time to do this one, but you could be thinking about this question. What frequency of sounds would be good for this bat to produce? high or low, knowing everything we know now, you should think, oh, 
low frequencies travel a lot further than high frequencies. So this bat should be using low frequencies because it needs its sound to go way out in front of it so that it can fly fast, like driving a car fast at night. Um, and then would you think then that this bat would echolocate loudly or softly? And again, you should be thinking, well, it should be loud because we need to get, it needs to get its sound way out. And that's correct. So you can start figuring out how these bats behave based on what we know about them. So now this is great. This hoary bat can fly long distances. It can go all the way down to the south for, um, for the winter, for example. Uh, it's, it's built for speed, but it's using low frequencies. And there is a downfall to that, right? Because it can't detect the small insects. It can only detect the larger ones. So a hoary bat could easily detect this moth, for example. But that mosquito, it doesn't even know it's there. So in, in the end, not all bats are eating mosquitoes, especially these large ones using low frequencies. But on the other end of the scale, we've got the small, slow bats. And these bats are very maneuverable. And they just often live in the forest all the time. And they're just maneuvering around, flying around. Everything's right in front of them. They don't need their sound to go very far. So they can use the high frequencies. And they can be very soft because, again, it's all right in front of them. They don't need to scream as loudly. So hooray, this type of bat then is able to eat a lot of uh, insects that are around because there's a lot of small insects around, as we all know, being out at night if, if you've been um, in areas where there's a lot of mosquitoes, for example. But again, the trade-off here is they're not flying very fast or far. So they do have to spend the winters here and they're gonna have to tuck into a cave or a mine or a crevice somewhere to hibernate when there's no insects. So now how do bats catch insects? Well, they can catch them in their wing. They can catch them in their tail membrane. But one big question is, can some bats catch insects that aren't even flying? And the answer is yes. And this is pretty cool because these are a neat group of bats. They're ones that have very big ears, big ears or long ears. They can catch their insect prey then by listening for the sounds that the bugs actually make. So here's a bat flying around listening with its big ears for the scurry of a beetle or the movement of a, of a spider or the flap of the wings of a moth. And then it can grab them off the vegetation, off the leaf and eat them. Similar is pallid bats. Now pallid bats don't approach a leaf to get insects off of it, but they are looking for food on the ground. So they're flying along with their big ears, literally facing the ground while they fly so that they can listen for the scurry of something like this, a Jerusalem beetle. This is their favorite. The Jerusalem beetle moves along on the ground. The pallid bat hears it. It drops down and eats the pallid or eats the Jerusalem beetle on the ground. Kind of like, um, you know, kind of like a vampire bat in that it likes to hang out on the ground, which is pretty unusual. Bats don't usually crawl around on the ground. It can also eat scorpions. So it's not just insects that it, it can eat. It can also eat scorpions, which is really neat. It's our only bat that does that. And finally, uh, our last really cool bat I wanted to tell you about is a spotted bat. It's really unusual bat. It's got big, huge pink ears. And it eats kind of an unusual moth. It's a moth that has ears on its abdomen. Now, just before I dive into the bat, let's talk about the moth, because this is a really interesting moth. It's got these little ears on the side of its abdomen that hear bat ultrasound. So when a bat is producing its echolocation calls, the moth detects that and, and literally drops out of the sky so that it doesn't get eaten. And as the bat's trying to catch it, phew, the moth drops. Well, that's really good for the moth. It doesn't get eaten by the bats because it hears ultrasound. Well, come back to this um, table I'd shown you before, this graph. Remember that anything above 20 kilohertz we call ultrasound. And I told you that that's what bats produce. Well, the spotted bat with the big pink ears is really unusual because it's producing these low frequencies that our ears can hear. We don't need a bat detector to hear a spotted bat. They're producing audible sound not ultrasound. Now that does mean that they can only find really big moths, but that's okay because one of these big eared moths, one of these moths which have these, um, sorry, these ears, is huge. And so if they eat just a couple of those, that's a nice big meal. And as you can see by the little cartoon here, that moth doesn't know the bat is going to eat it because that moth 
only hears ultrasound. And this bat isn't producing ultrasound. It's producing lower frequency sounds. So it's pretty cool that this bat evolved to do something all very different from all the other bats. But it got to eat insects then that the other bats can't see or can't catch, I should say. Sorry. Okay. Last on a conservation note, because I'm a conservation biologist, I, I couldn't leave you without one little note about some things that we can be doing better for bats. Bats depend on their ears. And as we've just, just discovered now, bats, some of them also have to hear their insects. It's not just their own echoes. They need to hear the insect prey. And that's really, really hard if the environment's too noisy. And of course, the, the environment nowadays is becoming noisier and noisier due to um, things like driving our cars along the highways and um, gas wells and oil, oil wells and so on. So just something to think about. So uh, I know we're going to do a Kahoot, but just one question to end here um, on a fun little quiz to look at these pictures. If you look at pictures A, B, C, and D, look carefully at those bats. Oh. And can you figure out which one do you think would most likely be most likely to listen for sounds generated by the prey that they eat, the insects? Okay, we're going to go to Caratero, uh, our Wexford school friends. What do you think? A, B, C, or D for most likely to in listen to sounds from insects? Mix of answers. What do we think? A. A, overwhelmingly A, big ears. I think that might be right. <laughs> you guys, you're awesome. Yes, you, you, you nailed it. It's A for sure. Excellent. Big ears, let them listen for insects. Okay, so I think we, um, I turn it over to you now, Jesse, right? Yeah, well, first and foremost, Dr. Lawson, thank you so much for such a neat presentation. So cool to explore the world of bats. And I've always particularly loved the idea that they can turn off their ears with that sort of built-in ear plug. It's one of my very favorite things I ever learned about our, our bat friends. And so, yeah, if you want to come out of screen share, we are going to start with our okay. Kahoot now for everybody. Uh, so feel free to do that. I'll bring you back in once you've had the chance to get that already. But folks, we're going to do a Kahoot together. Test your understanding. Have a little bit of fun. If you aren't already in the Kahoot, the pin is 273-1521. If you don't want to play, that's totally fine. You can just play along and get those answers in your classes. Uh, but we are going to dive in. The faster you answer, the more points you get. And you don't win anything, but you do win our everlasting respect here at Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants and the Royal BC Museum. I will say one of our names in the Kahoot is Aquatic Bat. It's our only bat name, so I kind of, I'm rooting for you, aquatic bat, whoever you might be. The faster you answer, more points you get. Let's dive in with those questions, and Corey, you can help us out in the final few seconds for every one of these questions, okay? Here we go. I'm so excited. Question number one. Three, two, one. Quiz. Which of the following foods are things that the bats in British Columbia are not known to eat? What don't our bat friends eat? Insects, spiders, scorpions, or nectar? All right, we got a bunch of answers really fast. 10 more seconds to go. 22 answers so far. Welcome in, guys. We've got groups across BC, Illinois, Mexico, New Mexico today. 32 answers, three seconds left. Corey, what's our final tally gonna be? Okay, 35 of you. Most of you got this right. Nectar is correct, which is very Good cool. Job. Bats do eat our insects, spiders, scorpions. We talked about that. Very, very cool. Okay, let's see what our leaderboard is. Brave Gecko's got the lead through one. Way to go, Brave Gecko. Let us know who you are in the chat, too. Question two, bats are blind. True or false? Really rapid fire answers to this. Everyone's chiming in. Okay. So this is like our one of our classic thoughts about bats. A lot of people think bats are blind. Are they? Everyone answered. False. Most of you got this right. Twelve of you got it wrong. Bats have... Good eyes, Corey, like they can see perfectly well, right? Excellent vision. Some of them even see really well in color. There you go. They have uh, amazing ears, but that doesn't mean they're bad at the other things. Space Stork takes our lead. All right, question number three, another true or false. Bats are rodents or flying mice. And you got this picture of a mouse. You put some wings on him. Maybe it becomes a bat. What do we think? Mm, it's are a bats... tough one. It's a <laughs> tough one. <laughs> are they related to mice? Are they different? What do we think? True or false? Ooh, five more seconds. Mm -hmm. Get those answers in, everybody. And one more question after this. Then we'll dive in with your questions. I'll be coming to our Wexford school first. Ooh, nice Ooh. mix. Well, you thought true. Okay. Nice. I didn't go through this one. This was a trick question, but they kind of look like mice, and they're about the same size. But no, 
they're not even close to being related to mice. They are very, very different. They live a very long time and they only have one young usually per year. So that's really different from mice that have lots of young and don't live very long. Too many babies or so many babies. Which statement is not correct about North American bats? And I'll give you a hint that Dr. Lawson just gave you a hint. Oh, I did. Well. You're right. <laughs> I gave you a seconds. hint. <laughs> so what's, what's wrong? Young bats are called pups. Mother bats nurse their young with milk. Bats have many young throughout the summer. Bats can live for several decades. Now, you did mention a minute ago that bats do live a very long time, which is very cool, very unusual length of life for such a small creature. A really even mix. But the correct answer is that they don't have many young throughout the summer because they typically have one young, correct? Yeah, most species only have one. Some of them can have up to four, but that's pretty rare. Yeah, yeah. the milk thing's interesting. So all mammals, all things with fur, certainly, and a few things that don't even have fur, but are mammals, milk is the defining feature. So that's a thing that you can always link with mammals. Our winner of the program today, Space Stork, way to go. If you are any of those people, let us know who you are. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, but let's dive in with our questions, folks. We've got a bunch of groups joining on YouTube. If you want to share questions in the chat, great. But we're going to start in Mexico with our friends at the Wexford School. So Wexford School, come on up. If you have a question for Dr. Lawson, take us away. Hey, guys. That question. <laughs> Hi, come on up. Do you have a bet a question about bats? Anything you want to know? <laughs> oh, there's one somewhere. Excellent. <laughs> nice. Um, my question is why you decided to be to study the that fantastic animal? Yeah, why did you study when when and why did you study that decide to study these, Dr. Lawson? Oh, that's such a good question. Thank you. Um, you know, when I was uh going to university, I was offered to work on a job working with bats, and I thought, well, sure, why not? And then when I held one in my hand and it had a little band on it, we banned them so that we can uh follow them over the years. And, and I realized when I looked up that band number that that bat was older than I was at that time. Wow. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, how can such a small animal live for so long? And then I started looking into just how amazing they are and how unique they are because small mammals shouldn't live that long, but they got a lot of secrets. And then, and then I started to want to know more about those secrets and, and I started researching them. <laughs> I love how enthusiastic you are. This is the essence of a, a lot of the programs we bring on. People just start out really young with these amazing passions. And if you follow that through, do the education you need to learn as much as possible and just get excited about it. And then hopefully have the opportunity to share that passion with the world. It's a really great thing. So thank you for that question, guys, at Wexford School. I'll come back to you guys in just a minute. Um, Miss Erlinson's class joining us in New Mexico today. Their question is, uh, unfortunately, the devices are off. Um, if there was nothing for the sound to bounce off of, how would the bat see? Aha, uh -huh. that is a great question. If there is nothing for the sound to bounce off, they don't see anything. So it's like walking into the darkness and there's nothing and you just keep walking and you don't know what's out in front of you. Now, if, they, if the sound finally does hit something and bounces back, then they know that there's something there. But otherwise, the sound just keeps going and, and their brain knows that they can just keep flying because there's nothing in their way. Yeah, I guess uh, the closest weird parallel, uh, we're talking about space. If you were in space and you blast the sound out, there's nothing for it to go through. So there's nothing for it to echo off of. You wouldn't have that sort of impact. Not that we have bats in space. So it's a labored analogy, but <laughs> I like that question very much. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Avoca West, uh, Owen, by the way, congrats for winning our Kahoot today. Uh, if you want to come on in and Glenview, hey guys, welcome in. Here we go, and I have a question. We have several questions, so come back. I like that. <laughs> How does the bad detector work? Oh, the bad detector. Yeah. oh, that's a very good question. Well, you know, there's different types of bat detectors, and they work all slightly differently, but but the main principle is that it takes and converts the ultrasound to make it um, a bigger wave. So you can almost think of it like, uh, this is maybe dating me, but I used to play slinkies. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys know what those are. But if you, if you imagine like even one of the waves that I drew for you, okay, and then you stretched it way out like this, 
suddenly those wavelengths are now long. And that's what a bat detector does. It takes kind of these short, tiny little wavelengths, stretches them out like a slinky and makes them long and then plays those back to our ear. And we can hear those long wavelengths. We just can't hear the short ones. Fascinating. By the way, every class should know what a slinky is. If you don't know what a slinky is, go buy one immediately. They're the best. Slinkies um, are awesome. They are. Uh, let's go to West Kelowna, BC, Mr. Orcotch's class. If you guys want to unmute your mic, you are good to go. Come on in for a question. Hey, guys. <laughs> nice to see you again. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. Who okay. has a question? Put up your hand. Okay. No, don't stand up. Just put your hand up. Excuse me. What's your question? Okay, quick. Question? Hi. Okay, Ruby, question. What would happen if us humans like moved you know, like dislocated like Oh, yeah, what yeah. Happened? Yeah, if a, if a person had ears like the bat, what would happen? <laughs> Oh, if a person had ears, like as in, like could hear ultrasound or yeah, big the, ears? Like, this, the dislocating ear bones and the thing that we talked about earlier with the ability to mute themselves, sort of thing, would be fascinating. Oh, it would, wouldn't it? I mean, if you, so, if you had like ears like a spotted bat for on, for one thing, that would be kind of cool because your ears would be uh, <clears throat> the same length as your body above your head, right? And so you'd look kind of funny for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you couldn't, if you could disconnect your little ear bones, think how handy that could be, right? You know, someone's talking to you and you don't really want to hear them. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, but of course the downfall is if you did actually hear ultrasound too, man, yes. you'd go crazy. You'd probably go crazy because you would Pretty hear much. everything, everything. <laughs> yeah, I liked your breathing demonstration earlier. I'm really glad we don't hear people breathing like that. Oh. Um, Yes. Awesome. Let's take a few quick questions from YouTube. We got a bunch of classes there, and then we'll go back to some of our classes live. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, so we might make a Padlet so that you guys have the opportunity to share more questions after the broadcast. I'll set that up while we're going. Uh, but Mr. Police Class in Horn Payne, Ontario, wants to know: Do bats ever run into trees, Corey? <laughs> Not that we know of, but you know, it's like the old saying, if a tree falls in the forest, does anybody hear? <laughs> if, a, if a bat did hit a tree, would we, would we ever know about it? <laughs> no. But I don't think I, you know, based on uh, um, everything they're able to do, there is no way that they would hit um, a tree unless the tree hit them. So, yeah. you know, if a tree's falling and it, and they're in the way that could happen, of course, this happens with them. Wind turbine blades, for example, they're moving and the bat is not expecting anything like that to be moving. It's almost like a tree. They see the, the wind turbine and think, well, that's like a tree. Uh, but it's got these big blades and those blades will sometimes hit the bat or, or, or end up killing them, uh, which is really unfortunate. But a tree, no. They, um, as long as it's not falling, they will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no whomping willows coming for the bats. Yeah. Um, Tippins, Ontario, Miss Curion's class. Uh, how can bats find food? I guess how you can take this in a number of directions, but however you want to answer that. Well, this is a good question because insects aren't everywhere. I mean, they kind of are, but, but for a bat to find them, it has to be, there has to be enough of them to make it worth it. Flying is very energetically expensive. You can imagine like how hard it is to fly 10, 10 beats a second, flapping your wings that fast, you burn through the energy. So you have to find places where there's lots of food, not just a little insect here and there. So they're gonna go to places that they know have a lot of insects. And typically that's in places that have water. So like wetlands are great for bats because wetlands produce a lot of insects, including mosquitoes and midges and things that they can they can eat. And forests, forests will have a lot of moths um, and especially really healthy forests with lots of um, understory. So they will zero in on those areas rather than spending their time out in areas that are less likely to have bugs. Fantastic. Thanks, Corey. I hope that answer. Um, <laughs> we did just make a Padlet, by the way. I know we're at the 40 minute mark. And so Corey, I'll make sure you and Liz have this at the end of the broadcast, but we're going to take a couple more questions from our live groups. If you have any additional questions after the program is done, a Padlet is like a virtual whiteboard. You can share some of those additional questions uh, and we'll get to them over the next two days. If you want to share any more questions there, you don't get them answered today. That is your way that you can do that. Wexford School, Kara Darrow, uh, coming back to you guys for another live question. Hey, everyone. Hello, hello. Any other back questions? You can take off your mask if you want. Is it true that if bugs are uh, revealed to the sun, they can burn? I didn't get that question. Yeah, the last bit, what was the last part? If they get if the sun hits them, what happens to them? 
if the sun hits a bat, um, the bat can burn. Oh, can burn? Like give a, have a baby or? Born. Born of fire. Can't get on fire. Get on fire. Oh, on fire. Oh, okay. yeah. No, um, uh, it, that that won't happen. But bats do avoid sun, um, and they like they typically avoid the sun because there's so many predators in the daytime that will eat will eat them. So they typically hide. Uh, so yeah, bats don't like the sun, but it's just because they really don't want to be out there where predators can see them like, like birds, like, um, a lot of different types of, of birds, like corvids and, and owls and, and hawks, you know, the, the birds will eat bats <laughs> and during the day, that's a bad thing. <laughs> they don't want to be out there. <laughs> not, not the best way to, to go out. I, no. I, incidentally, I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario. And last year in July, it got to be about 50 degrees Celsius with the humidity. And that feels like you're going to set on fire. So I understand the concern. Uh, too, too long. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, Avoca West, if you guys have another one for us, come on back in. Ingrid, come on. Um, why is the spotted bat called the spotted bat? Yeah. Oh, I, you know, that's a great question. And I didn't actually get to show this to you. You can see in, in the book that we have, we've got pictures of all sides of the bats. So you get to see it in the book, but I realized I didn't get a chance to show you a picture on their, on their back. They're a black bat, but on their back, they've got three bright white spots. So that's why they're called spotted. Well, I'll have to send the kids to look that up. So you guys can look up spotted bats. Yeah. You'll see those big spots. Look up Very spotted cool. bats. So you'll find them online. Yep. <laughs> guys, time flies and you're having fun. I want to take one more question from Ms. Erlinson's class in New Mexico. They want to know how fast can bats fly before we wrap up? <laughs> Oh, you know, it's so variable because some bats can fly really fast. Um, they can even go like 50, 60 kilometers an hour. So that's oh. a, that's really fast. Um, what's really cool is the, is one really fast bat is called the Mexican free tail or sometimes it's called the Brazilian free tail. And it goes up high and it's being picked up on radar of, um, of, uh, you know, airplanes and it's flying so fast because it actually has a way to pull its tail up and tuck it next to its body cool. so that it doesn't cause any drag. They're just yeah. these little streamlined missiles. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you, Corey. What a neat answer to that. Um, guys, I know you have many more questions about bats. We have to wrap up the program soon, but if you do want to share any additional ones, head to that pad, the link, type in your questions. Uh, Dr. Lawson and the Royal BC team will have the chance to get to that in the days to come. Uh, and I just want to say a huge thank you to all our class today. If you want to check out Backyard Bio, go find your own bats close to home. Uh, Bat Conservation International is a really fantastic organization. Uh, if you want to learn more about bats, learn how you can help them close to home wherever you're joining from. Uh, and Corey, before we wrap up, is there any final message about bats before we bring in our class to say a big goodbye? Oh, I just think, you know, go out there and try to learn as much as you can about bats. Be batty. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, Wexford School of Oka West, thank you so much for joining. Come on in and join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye for now, guys. <laughs>